Okay, so I think perhaps we can slowly, slowly uh, start the conversation. Shall I... Um, so I will remind you that today we are going to look at the topic, we're going to explore together the, the notion of service, leadership and driftology. And just a little anecdote about the title. So uh, in the beginning I was writing it service, comma, leadership and driftology, which is three things. And then it turned into service leadership. Um, so I think there is a slight nuance there, which we might want to um, think about perhaps. And today we have as our guest speaker, Martin Kalungu Banda, who is one of the co-founders of the Ubuntu Lab and also of this new dialogue series on YouTube called uh, Zambition, which is a, a combined name between Zambia and Ambition. Uh, Martin will tell us about his uh, leadership experiences and we will explore together what service leadership means to him, to us, and then Martin will also share with us what he means by the term driftology and we're all very curious to hear about that. So um, I would like to invite Martin to um, tell us a, a little bit about himself and, um, oh, and Martin's gone. <laughs> so we'll wait for Martin to come. Martin has, I think Martin has a slightly wobbly connection, but you, you, you're popping in and out. Martin, are you, are you ready to um, start to tell us about what, what uh, service leadership is for you? And tell us about yourself first, um, you know, about your work and the notion of service leadership and um, what does driftology mean with you, mean for you, sorry. Thanks, Rachel, and greetings, everyone. I have no idea why I keep on dropping, but um, I uh, have switched on to 4G rather than just using internet, so I hope uh, that that works. Yes, we I, are hearing you now, yes. Yeah, I, yes, my, my name is Martin Kalongo Panda, uh, originally from Zambia, living and working out of Oxfordshire in the last 17 years, but I, before uh, COVID-19 happened, I am regularly on the, on the continent, uh, the continent of Africa. My current work uh, essentially is that of a facilitator. In some form, I may come across as a teacher, uh, but facilitator is more appropriate. Uh, we within the Presencing Institute community where we facilitate many transformational journeys uh, for organizations, teams, but I also spend a little bit of time in the academic cycles uh, at the Said Business School, University of Oxford, uh, supporting uh, MBA students uh, use theory U uh, to integrate their leadership and orientation for action. I also spend a little bit of time with MIT Collab, uh, where we teach uh, values-based banking for small but certainly effective challenger banks that are saying finance can be a force for good, but we have to be intentional about how that happens. And uh, service leadership, like many things that either I've written about or reflected upon, was a term that came about, at least for me, when I had a conversation with a colleague who uh, many of you know, um, Kate Rayworth the author of um, Donut Economics. She lives uh, about 40, 45 minutes away from where I'm speaking from. And at one time we were having a chat 
and I shared with her that I was going to run a program based on my first book on Nelson Mandela. And she said, what's the title? That sounds interesting. And then I said, Servant Leadership. And then she says, oh my God, Martin, I almost liked the title. And I said, what do you mean you almost like the title? She said, I like the notion of service, but not servant. Because servant has been so misused. People who are not considered equal, um, particularly when you come from regions and communities where immediately you become middle income uh, as a household, you can afford so many people you call servants around you, and they get very little um, to barely survive. So she said that's what for her uh, disturbed the notion, old notion of servant leadership. And I began then to use the word or the term service leadership. So Rachel, that's, that's where this came from. Thank you, thank you Martin for this framing and for, for you know, surfacing this very important distinction which I think, you know, our use of words has to be very careful, there are connotations and there's so many, um, so many embedded meanings that um, we, you know, it's, it's good to make that distinction. So, the, um, Martin was alluding to, you know, service leadership versus servant leadership. Um, I would, um, because we have a few new people in the room, Martin, I will just take one moment to, um, to frame quickly and so-called reset the room. So welcome everyone who has come in in the last few minutes. We are here today to have uh, a dialogue, a conversation together about service leadership and driftology with Martin Kalungu Banda, who is our guest speaker today. Um, and we would like to invite all of you to raise your hand at any point during the, this conversation if you would like to be invited onto the stage and then um, be able to speak by unmuting yourself. So as long as you are staying in the audience, you will not have a microphone. Uh, please note that the session is being recorded because we still have many people who, who wanted to join the session but who are unable to, so we would like to offer a recording for those who are not able to be here today. We also have a lot of new users who are trying to make their way through Clubhouse, still struggling, and so they might not have been successful in joining. So please do not speak if you don't want your voice to be recorded. Um, when invited to speak, please use the convention of opening by saying your name and location, because some people are, you know, they have a phone um, with their screens off, so always say your name, your location, um, make your contribution, and then wrap up with uh, stating again your name, your location, and by saying I'm done speaking. And we will be moving people on um, in onto stage. And if um, you know if there are too many people on the stage, we can move them back in batches to to the audience. But we'll just see how how the flow goes. Um, so thank you, Martin, for for framing um, this this um, concept of service leadership. And I would also like to invite any of our other moderators or, or David, if you would like to speak to. Um, what Martin has, has said so far. This is Rachel, I'm done speaking. Or anyone from the audience, um, please, you can raise your hand by, by tapping the little um, hand icon. Oh, and I see Mohammed has come on stage. Mohammed, hello and welcome. I think you're already unmuted, so if you would like to say something, um, please feel free to do so. Or oh, David. David, have you unmuted? Uh, can you? Oh, we did hear you. Little Yes, Mohammed, we hear you. No, I, I have nothing to add now. <laughs> oh, okay, that's all right. <laughs> You get, well, you're welcome to stay with us on stage. So, um, so let's um, let's move forward in the in the conversation. So, um, Martin, can you tell us more about how 
uh, this notion of service leadership connects to, um, you know, the, the, the notion of driftology, which you, when we first had a conversation about driftology, you also mentioned that there is something about driftology that connects to serendipity. Would you like to um, tell us about, about that and how you came upon this notion? Thanks, Rachel. So, uh, driftology is a concept um, for me that uh, my, one of my young brothers coined. It was at a time when I was launching the book on Nelson Mandela uh, that I had written a collection of stories that I kept coming across um, almost effortlessly. When I tuned into the leadership style and manifestation of Nelson Mandela, it was like Providence also allowed me to find these stories. And over a year or two, I collected them and then I wrote the book and um, we launched the book in South Africa. We went to launch the book in Zambia. And at one time I was invited by a radio station called Radio Phoenix in Zambia. And one of my young brothers gave me a lift and he elected to listen to the interview, which was live from his car. So I had the interview and at one time, the interviewer said, lines are open. Colleagues out there who feel like interacting with Martin, please phone in and ask your question or make a comment uh, on how he is describing the core piece of, of his book. And one of the callers, whose name I remember very well because I knew him um, at university, his name is Dan. So Dan called and said, hey, Martin, congratulations on your book. But I'm pretty sure, Martin, you know that there are children out there, young people out there listening to you at this point in time. I'm pretty sure you know that there are children who share your background. I happen to know that you grew up in a village. You first came to the capital city only when you qualified to go to university. There were many things that you never knew because you grew up elsewhere in the rural parts of northern Zambia. But those children who are listening would also like to know how does a village boy who sees the capital city only because they have passed to qualify to go to university end up doing what you have done. And then he cataloged a number of things um, that I didn't even expect him to know. Among the things that he said, look here, as a village boy, you have um, gone on to create the new business ethics course that runs at the University of Zambia. You created that and you were not even a senior lecturer. How does a village boy do that? And I also know that at one time, you became acting managing director for the largest oil company in the country. How does a village boy just run their way through and do that? How does a village boy uh, then uh, end up uh, working for an international development organization, leading an aspect of it, and he was making reference to Oxfam. And uh, the same village boy, uh, now has written a book which just the previous day was launched by the head of state and uh, all the luminaries you can think of in the capital city. Young people who share your background are listening. What is it that has allowed you to do that? And colleagues, at that point, I could only pause. And when I paused in that moment, I could see my life as if I was watching a movie on a screen. 
it was in a very short period of time because that question must have lasted less than two minutes. But I had a panoramic view of, of my life. And then I responded, I said, Dad, I wish I could tell you that I am very strategic. I wish I could tell you that I orchestrate uh, my moves and faithfully stick to them. I wish I could tell you I'm extremely disciplined. When I choose to do something, I achieve it. That wouldn't be true. What I know is that I have merely drifted. At any one moment in my life, I am simply drifting. And then I meet a guardian angel who holds my hand and they take me to the next place. Then I continue drifting. And then another guardian angel holds my hand and the next. It looks logical when you look back, but it wasn't. And I don't remember the feeling of it being logical. I finished the interview and as I went to join my young brother in his car, then he said to me, so when are you going to write about that driftology theory of yours? So that was the first time I heard of the term driftology. And he said, he just said it because he heard me talk about drifting. And over the years, then I sat with that concept and I started sharing elements that I considered drifting. And people would say, oh, that is how I have led my life. Now that you say it, that makes sense. That's how I see things. So I ended up creating a formula, maybe call it a recipe because it's less uh, mathematical. But the equation runs like the following. Open bracket, drifting plus guardian angels plus living the moment. Close bracket, multiply by spontaneity is what tends to give us great, uh, exponential great life opportunities. Drifting plus guardian angels plus living the moment. When you multiply that with spontaneity, you are likely to access exponential great life opportunities. I stop there, Rachel. Thank you, Martin, for this wonderful recipe. And I think this might be a good moment for us to just take a pause and let sink in what Martin has just shared. So um, I'm going to invite you into just a moment of grounding right now um, and landing in your bodies and holding what Martin has just shared with us, this recipe of drift drifting plus, tell me if I, I'm getting this right, Martin, drifting plus guardian angels plus living in the moment multiplied by spontaneity equals access to exponential possibilities. So, um, yes, <laughs> thank you. So everyone, um, let's take a moment to breathe and to check in with our bodies. Just, just a, a, a moment of pause. Uh, you might wish to lower your gaze perhaps or close your eyes and let's feel our feet on the ground on the good mother earth and notice our energy and our, our body our body feeling to martin's words and ideas and however you came into this room whether it was in a rush or in a moment of stillness that preceded um, notice the vibration you're carrying right now and notice which parts of you have felt awakened by Martin's sharing his story. Are there any parts that are softened, opened up? And breathe in. And if you're feeling any parts that are knotted or hard, uh, breathe in and let those open. And just notice without judging the parts inside of you and feel the strength in your back, your head lifted up towards the sky just as your feet are, are firmly grounded and connect horizontally 
Let's connect out towards each other and send breath energy to our heart and just breathe in three times and let your thoughts drift. Breathe in, breathe out. And once more, the second time. In and out. And one last time, breathe in. And I would love to open up the floor a little bit to um, anyone who might want to share. So if you're on stage, please um, unmute if you'd like to speak or raise your hand if you would like to, to be called onto the stage. Um, a quick um, recap. So we're speaking about service, leadership and driftology. And if anyone would like to perhaps share their experience of drifting into an opportunity and embracing an opportunity, whether there was a guardian angel or not. Um, have you ever drifted into a new possibility that you couldn't rationally make sense of in the first moment, for instance? Um, has that ever happened to you? And I'm, I'm remembering uh, a time in, li in my life where I was doing many things, but not really able to make rational sense of why I was making certain choices, but I just felt this energy for certain things. And one of them was online learning. Um, so my, I had several online learning experiences back in 2000, in 2016. And I just went where the energy was and the ULAB Theory U was one of those. Um, it was at a time I had just finished another online course with edX which was about entrepreneurship and the ULAB felt like it was bringing in this energy that was missing for me um, new pieces in in the picture of my life but I couldn't really make sense of it because I had almost chanced upon it by by you know by pure coincidence a friend had sent me um, an email saying May, maybe you might be interested in this and I started uh, looking at it and I thought it was requiring a lot of time and I might just kind of skirt around it a little bit and then I got engaged. And I wouldn't have really been able to know then where it would have taken me, which uh, today it's very closely connected to what I, what I do um, in my work. But at the time it didn't make sense. So 2016 was a year full of drifting, full of drifting. Um, I, I took the ULAB course, I was also, I went to a um, global, um, it was the Hive Global Leaders Program in San Francisco, it was a three, three and a half day um, event workshop, and I didn't really know why I was there, but I just felt I, I needed to be there, and I had the opportunity, I, I was offered a scholarship, and I met a lot of interesting people, but still it wasn't making rational sense, which is why I'm so glad, um, Martin, you spoke about, you know, sometimes it's um it's not a feeling of being logical there was no logic there and it's only on hindsight that all of these pieces kind of joined together and made sense for me and i see we have um jero and jennifer on stage so um if you would like to unmute and speak i invite you to share your thoughts with us jero So I'm, I'm having some technical difficulties on my end, so I'll ask if I can maybe come back. In. Of course, yes. Um, yes, we'll wait for you to sort those out. Jennifer, would you like to unmute and speak? Hi, this is Jennifer, and I'm calling from Freeport, Maine. Um, yeah, what you were just saying was uh, I felt very connected to. I had a similar experience, and I hadn't really thought of this as this drifting as something positive until really recently, uh, but I have certainly experienced it a couple of times, and most recently, um, well, I should say first, um, I was working as an art therapist many years ago, probably 2005, and I had the qualifications to do, to do a job that I hadn't taken um, because I thought it wasn't something that I could be good at enough, even though I had all the qualifications. 
And it came to be that this organization, the school, really needed somebody in this position. And they kind of looked at me and I said, well, I don't really know that I can do that. I don't feel like I'm ready. This isn't my time. I need to be more prepared. And I had all this anxiety around not being good enough to do it. Um, and the need was there for someone to teach the first grade class at this Waldorf school. And, and it was really this opportunity that felt like if I don't do this, I really don't know who will. And we really do need someone to do this. And I jumped into this career that I never imagined I would have. I never imagined I would be a teacher. I had the qualifications to really to serve my work as an art therapist with children. Um, and that became just the biggest joy after being a parent <laughs> my entire life to spend to get to know these people who now I have this rich, incredibly deep relationship with over eight years being their teacher. I never would have decided proactively to go seek that out, but it came to my path. And um, that was a truly life-changing experience. And then the second experience is just last fall, and this reflects yours, you were just saying, um, I reached out to a friend, I had left a job, I had this opportunity to leave this position. I took it, and I didn't have any plan at all. And he reached out to a friend and said, what do you think? And he said, you should go to business school at MIT. And I said, what? Business? I've never even thought about business. But he said, you have to check out Art Otto Scharmer. So I did, and I decided I didn't want to go to business school, but I jumped into the 1X course, um, which led to a 2X team around education, which led to now a position I have um, for work, but also in a project that's connected to our 2X team. And I just, I find it so incredibly amazing that I can be doing this work, which feels like so joyful, so connected to everything I ever wanted to do, but didn't know it. And I could never have planned it this way. So it's just, I feel this is a very refreshing topic. Sometimes I feel like it's um, weird to end up in places like this. But so thank you. This is Jennifer from Freeport and I am done speaking. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your, for sharing with us your story. And um, I wanted to ask Martin in that regard, like, how, how have you dealt with the, um, you know, qualified but not good enough feeling? Because I think that when, when we stretch into new spaces of exploration, there is sometimes that imposter syndrome thing. Well, I, I know that I, for, for one, have had it often. It's like, what am I, what am I doing here? Um, am I good enough? And driftology is also, I think, about the courage to to just embrace the feeling of, of maybe not being adequate enough, but also courageous enough to, to, tr to try our hand at it. What do you think, Martin? Rachel, thank you. Is there a chance we can just invite in Stefan, Stephanie Ray before we can... Um, yes. We can, yeah, because I think he, he, he shows on my my, my yes. phone that he, he, Yes, please. To speak. Yeah. Yes, Stephanie. Stephanie Ray, would you like to unmute and speak? Thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Um, yes, thanks for for sharing, uh, Martin. It really um, really resonates with me, um, with my life and all that happens, all the opportunities and and experiences in my life. Um, I really resonate to the mindset and the heart set that you, you shared. Um, I just thought I could share other words um, that express the same as what you shared and maybe it's from a different light um, from, my, from my experience. So it's the first time I hear the word driftology and I, I appreciate it. In, my experience, I call it the flow intelligence. Um, and that has been guiding me uh, in my life to trust, surrender, flow with life. So when I hear your, uh, I thought it was a recipe or equation that made me think exactly in the same way as what you shared, but with other words, um, flow plus trust plus mindful presence multiplied by heart guidance. 
So that's really, I, I, I feel and I understand exactly what you share and I feel it's like another lens on, on, on what you share. Um, and another thing I, I also um, fully, fully agree on your perspective on uh, the evolution of leadership. And I feel much more comfortable as well with service leadership. But before hearing you, I would express it as heart-led leadership in service to the whole. And I feel it's maybe like a, one more um, enrichment to what you shared. So thank you so much. And I'm done. I'm Stephanie from France. Thank you very much, Stephanie. For your sharing so we now have another we have two recipes one which is uh, drifting plus guardian angels plus living in the moment time spontaneity and um, now offered by stephanie the recipe of flow plus trust plus mindful presence times heart heart um, guidance in order to access exponential possibility Thank you. And um, I wanted to check with Randy whether Randy you were you were wishing to share something with us. Yes. Hi everyone. I'm Randy. I'm calling in from Amsterdam. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Perfect. Um, well, listening to Martin, it uh, gave me a feeling of reassurance. I'm in my mid twenties, and I just finished my studies and. Uh, you look at all these people, these inspirational people that are achieving so many things in their life and this often gives young people like me some kind of pressure of, okay, where do I have to go? I want to achieve great things as well and um, I find it very reassuring to hear that actually they also don't know what they are, uh, how they came where they are and that they are just drifting along and um, yeah, that it's not a plan and steps that you're taking in your life, but they, that you're just following your heart, uh, the flow, and um, yeah, that with the time you get to this point. And yeah, I, I want to thank Martin for this, and uh, it's the first time I hear about this concept of driftology, but uh, I'm very intrigued. Um, yeah, this is Randy, and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Randy. Um... Martin, would you like to respond to any of these contributions? Thanks. Um, I, I, I do love uh, everything I'm hearing. Um, and um, Stephanie, the flow of intelligence is fascinating. And on the question of inadequacy, uh, th that for me is the story of my life. Um, inadequacy. Almost everything I've done is uh, the beginning is inadequacy, then I'm helped around by people around me. So you can imagine within 24 months of joining the University of Zambia as a junior lecturer, you start making a claim that you would introduce a new course. And all these professors and PhD orders are looking at you and say, what? What's wrong with you? And somehow, as you stick to that, then a new course is born. But it's not because you are clever and hardworking. It's just because immediately you say, I want to do this. Then everything around you conspires to support you. Clearly, when I was going to work for BP, I just wanted this job that I thought I understood, corporate affairs guy. I was. And because I was teaching business ethics, I thought I could actually turn this job into something fantastic. Except a month later, and my boss walks into my office, the managing director and says, Oh, Martin, I'm on my annual leave for one year, for one, one month. And then I said, Enjoy the one month. We'll miss you, but enjoy. He realized that I didn't look at my emails. Then he said, Okay, what did you ask to check your emails? I checked, he was standing by my desk. And he had sent a message to uh, the entire company. He said, well, I'm going on leave for one month. Where I will be, there is no access to telephone. Uh, Martin will be the acting managing director. I stood up and I said, you must know I'm just a teacher. You, 
you can't leave me with the largest oil company in the country. And he looked at me, smiled, and said, you don't expect me to withdraw that email, do you? And he walked away. I felt every management meeting I held in that month, I chaired, I felt so inadequate. But there was this company secretary who almost smelled what I was going through. So he would say, so next Monday, or this would be on a Thursday or a Friday, so what would be the focus? And he would help me, run me through. And early in the morning on the material day, he would be with me until I chaired one meeting after another. But that was the same when I went to work for the president. I didn't have any experience as chief of staff to any head of state. It's just that this president felt like I could do the job. But somehow, at that time, the boss I had worked with in, in Oxfam had also become an, an advisor to Tony Blair, number 10 Downing Street. And I just said, let me try. And, uh, and he, he answered the call. And and then I told him, and he said, oh, please do come in. Powell, who is the chief of staff to the prime minister, might just help you. And that's how I started getting mentored as I was doing the job on the other side. So, uh, and I, I'm not saying I don't work hard, but I wouldn't also claim the results of some of the things that have happened. It's the concept, now I drift more intentionally. Now I, I, I have little practices that help me so how did the day go? What is the new line that might be emerging that I'm not noticing? And through different practices, particularly as we work with in the Presencing Institute community, then I can claim that being slightly older now and having reflected on this, now I drift more intentionally than before. And Randy, that's why for me, um, when I look at um, a young person like you uh, uh, being so aware and intentional, then you are going to see many, many uh, drifts because life doesn't give us one. It gives us multiple. And when we begin to see them, we can elect which one we hope on, and then it takes us for some time, and then we see other possibilities, and then we hope on the next. I am Martin, and I'm complete. Thank you, Martin. I love this um, notion that lo life gives us many dr drifting opportunities and then to choose from, in fact, and it's up to us to see them and ride on them. Um, I would like to invite Tumi Sang to, to speak. Tumi Sang? Oh, hi, sorry. I was speaking. I, I, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm to be saying and I'm from South Africa. I must say I'm very intrigued about the word driftology. Um, it's a word that going forward I'm going to really include. Um, so for me, when I heard everything that everybody has been talking about, you know when um, one of the speakers mentioned uh, imposter syndrome, that sometimes you find yourself in positions and you're like, oh my God, and you need to breathe, you know. Martin, your story is so resonating with where I have been, where I have found myself. Because um, I did my become accounting, but I'm old, and, and, and I also did studies of a company secretary, but I've just never practiced. So when I found myself having to do the work, because compliance is such a big thing, you know, I feel like I was also just drifting. But I, I always like using the, the nine attitude of mindfulness, because you have that beginner's mind, and that you trust. And I believe that um, the universe puts you wherever you're supposed to be. So with every step and every lesson, I always felt like um, part of a higher being that's, that puts you there. So now I've got it more specifically, I'm going to call it uh, Diftology. Yeah, thank you. And to be and I'm done speaking. Thank you very much, to me, Sang, for... for um, this this um, notion of the universe putting you where you need to be and there's there's this element of surrendering to and also I think the 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 ability to see maybe to see through or to see beyond and um, going back to something Martin you were saying earlier I think 
sometimes it's also the mirroring that someone else offers us that shows us um, a higher possibility than one that we might have dared imagine by ourselves. Um, dared to imagine. And I remember also Otto Sharma speaking about that sometimes, that um, if someone, it could be a mentor, or it could be a friend, it could be someone who sees in you what you're not yet seeing yourself, and that can be, you know, a, a way to, to just push you beyond the, the edge of what you, you're comfortable with and stepping into a new possibility. Um, I would like to just check with Antoinette. Antoinette, did you want to come in and say something? Or maybe, uh, yes? Not particularly. I'm just, I'm really enjoying the conversation and uh, the idea of drifting more intentionally. That's mm -hmm. what I, I, is sticking with me right now. So, okay. yeah, thank you for this lively conversation. Thanks. And um, Grace, would you like to speak? You um you will need to tap on the little um the little microphone. Oh, Grace, you you went off stage again. Maybe so. I will I will try to invite you back to the stage. Um, you you can decline if that's not what you if you do not have the intention to speak. But you may have just pressed the wrong button. There's a little microphone bu button at the there. You go. Um, I'm hearing hello? yes. Hello, hello, Grace. Yes, yes, I can hear you. It's it's odd because I'm seeing your your mic icon is crossed out, so it looks like you're muted, but I'm hearing your voice. We're hearing your voice. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm very grateful to be part of this conversation. My name is Grace, and I'm from Zambia. Um, I'm happy that there's a term for this. I never knew it was it existed but it now makes so much sense because sometimes you, I, I tend to have this strong urge and strong conviction to do certain things and if I'm more intentional about it, it usually works out. And there's a way the universe just brings things in your path and it makes so much sense and I'm, I'm actually living it and I'm, I'm really grateful. So I'm happy to learn of this new term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace. Um, Kenneth, would you like to speak to anything you've heard so far? Thank you, Rachel. I only joined the conversation part way through, so apologies if I'm not picking up on the first part of what was discussed. But on this topic about um, intentionally drifting, the image that comes to my mind when I think about this is that although when we hear people's stories looking back a week, it seems, it can seem as if they managed to plan a very direct route from where they began to where they got to and it all seamlessly aligned. Actually, I think the reality is that very often we're going through one door at a time. We only see the next set of doors. I mean, pick a door and we go through that one. And once we've been through that door, other doors are in front of us. And we pick a door and we go through that one. And then other doors are in front of us. And, and so it goes on. It is one door at a time. And this act of drifting may be informed by a gut feel for a sense of direction but i i think only very rarely can someone see through all the doors at once or several doors at once and therefore i think for me I mean, my experiences have been very often, the, the, the times that I've learned the most in my working life have been times when I took unexpected turn. For example, in my 20s, um, I was a, a young civil servant working in Scotland. And I 
got it into my head that I wanted to go and work for Bill Clinton, who had just become the president in the US. And because I was working on healthcare in Scotland, I decided I wanted to go and work on healthcare reform in the Clinton administration. And it was a completely ridiculous thing to to want. Um, but because I was young and impulsive and foolish, I just wrote a letter saying, hello, please can I come and work? And I got to reply a while later saying yes. <laughs> and they made it happen for me. And I had I had a couple of years of all kinds of remarkable experiences, um, which at the time seemed like they were a million miles away from anything that was relevant to the rest of my working life back in Scotland. But actually the things that I learned there, having gone through that door, I learned that, first of all, I can survive and even thrive in different contexts. I learned that I can be in different cultures and still make a contribution. I can still be of service in a very different working culture. Um, I can make friends in a different culture. I learned that the experiences I've had in Europe are, are actually translatable in that case to the US. And I was working on public health issues, so working on issues like HIV, um, working on issues like mental health, um, trying to provide a um, a wider level of healthcare coverage in the US at the time when that wasn't really available to about 50 million Americans. And it turned out that I could be of service in that different environment. And it was only many years later when I had when that's all finished that I realized the value that had brought. And so having gone through that door, now looking back at my life, I think that was a really important door that I walked through. But at the time, I only saw that one door. And I couldn't even see the next level of doors beyond that. So, drifting, I don't know if there was a sense of underlying calling that I paid attention to, and I, and I try to do that still. But I, but I certainly like the idea of drifting on the current and drifting from door to door rather than an idea of strategically planning a long-term route for a working life because I honestly don't believe that's most people's experiences. It certainly hasn't been like that. Thank you, I'm Kenneth from Edinburgh, Scotland, and I'm speaking. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Um, very, I, I have this very powerful visual um in, in my in my mind now of these doors and the the drifting through the doors and also that it it's as you were saying it's not necess they're not necessarily uh, aligned so you can't really see the next door until you've you've gone through one perhaps um so thank you thank you for that and i like the i like the also how you've you've worded you know being ridiculously daring um making a ridiculously bold request and what can come of that. And about that, I think sometimes we just have this feeling in, you know, in the belly, in the gut, that, that it's like a tipping point and you, you, you just take the plunge and great things can come of that. Um, so thank you for your sharing. And uh, I'm wondering, Yubesh, would you like to unmute and speak? I see you have yeah, come um, back. I'm listening actually, but definitely would love to share about the leadership, uh, the service leadership and technology in my understanding. Uh, I would say uh, I did have an experience of getting a first hand experience of learning the virtues of Buddha since it's the Buddha Purnima today and the day when Buddha got enlightenment was born. So I definitely have this experience of uh, getting nurtured by the values that I, I I got while I grew up because I I hope I always had that experience when my mom and dad and my particularly my parents would used to take me to the monasteries where Buddhist people the monks would live so that I would have 
an experience of how they would live and how they live their life with the learnings and the meditations they have. And uh, instilling such values, I definitely have grown up with the virtues of giving and having uh, based our life on someone else's uh, giving and we, we take it as uh, an opportunity for us to redeem with an opportunity to redeem ourselves, uh, to help and serve people. And this, uh, and again, I, I got, uh, got into a summer program of Buddhist studies back in summer 2020, and I got to, I got to know more about uh, the virtues of Buddha, which is truly amazing of how sacrifices and the, uh, the, the sense of giving is valued around the world, and particularly uh, how uh, the enlightenment he got was the sacrifices that he made and what he wanted to share it with the other people and his disciples was something really that moved me and that keeps me more interested towards the sense of um, the giving. But uh, Driftology, I am new to the term Driftology and definitely I did check out and did Google about it and found the book of Martin. So I. I would love to check out the book someday, and this is this is uh, for now. I am done talking. This is me, Yuvish. Over to you, Yuvish. Thank you very much, Yuvish. And um, Martin, I wanted to ask you in the wake of that. So, can can we say that you you actually invented the word driftology? Because if I Google driftology, the first result is your book. <laughs> I, I wish I could say yes. Uh, it's, uh, it's my kid brother uh, who, who said the word to me for the first time and it stuck. Later on when I tried to Google because people kept asking me, I found um, that there was uh, someone, a lady in the US that had also uh, written a book on driftology actually and used the term and I've tried to order it but um, always I find the uh, Amazon says not in stock. So the the one that seems to be available is the one inspired by my my my, my kid brother. And uh, I just wanted to take advantage of this to say thank you, Kenneth, for normalizing my experience. <laughs> I was sitting here saying yes, yes, Kenneth has gone through this. <laughs> but um, as you said, uh, probably a much more um, human experience than. Uh, uh, other teachings would like would like to tell us, and just to quickly link this with uh, the notion of service leadership. Um, I was at the time my family and I we were living and working in Cape Town, um, and on this material day, it was a Saturday, I think. Um, one of the most celebrated South African broadcasters, and uh, if I'm not mistaken. He has passed on me, so rest in peace. Um, his name, uh, his, the first name is Puyo. And he kept announcing, today is a very special day. Uh, because today we are launching, at that time we were in the CD mode, we are launching the CD on which the greatest speeches of Tate Mandela, Father Mandela, uh, are captured. So every few minutes he kept drumming it in and we all sat around waiting for that moment and then the hour came and the elderly retired statesman walks into the studio and as soon as he sat down, uh, Boyo says, Tata Mandela, how does it feel that today we are launching the CD on which your greatest speeches are captured? was a little pause. It's like Mr. Mandela was fishing for words. And then when he spoke next, he said, Voyo, I feel very sad. You could see how shocked Voyo was. We were shocked to hear that line. You, we are trying to celebrate the launch of your cities, and the line that comes first is, you are very sad. And then Mr. Mandela explained, Voyo, I feel very sad because although 
this is meant to be well. It misses the point. I was merely a vessel through which the great men and women of the struggle express their thoughts, their dreams and wishes. And quite often there will be a team that creates these speeches. And I was, for the reason I don't understand yet, picked to be that vessel through which this must be communicated. I would have loved if the speeches by Water Sisulu, Gobanin Beki, Tabon Beki, and other people were captured. Because my role was to be a vessel. So that for me is service leadership. I'm Martin, and I'm done speaking. Thank you, thank you, Martin. I think Jero wanted to come in with a comment, and then Stefan. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, gosh, Martin, you're such a phenomenal storyteller. And and, and I feel, well, I, I guess the first thing I want to say, I, I feel like I appreciate this offering, Driftology. I appreciate this conversation, and I appreciate the way in which you are putting yourself forward as a vessel for, um, for validating and, uh, and, and lifting up this way of moving through life. I think I, I feel very held by this conversation, and partly that's because I'm currently a student in policy school, and policy school is about it's about understanding a problem, defining it, figuring out how you most effectively and most efficiently and at the lowest cost come up with a solution to it. And I think that's that's how I understand that discipline. But in a sense, I, I also feel like the people that I've been surrounded by for some time are people who have a very clear sense of where they would like to go and who they think themselves to be. And uh, and so it can be it can be difficult to like Randy was saying, it can be difficult to think that there's value in not having that kind of insurance. Um, and, and so I, you know, and, and, and I guess I believe that there are different kinds of people and this being articulated and, and, and making space for this way of being uh, is a chance to then be intuitive. I think a lot about, well, because I'm in academia, I think about interdisciplinarity, and I think, I, I feel like one form that driftology takes in, in a university environment is this idea of, of moving from discipline to discipline, and from way of thinking to way of thinking. And um, if I look back briefly, and sorry, I know that we're at 12, 15, so I'll try to be quick. If I look back briefly, at some of them, some, something that has been beginning to make sense in my life is to see that where I am today, there were, there were very much seeds of two, three years ago, uh, working with the Presencing Institute. I, I know what conversations I was having and who I was having them with two or three years ago that eventually would lead me to the Presencing Institute. And, and so I think that the seeds of that and of who I was were already there. Um, and even if I go further back, I remember being 12, 11 years old. Um, I remember being in, I lived in India, and I remember being in certain, uh, I, I remember discovering, learning about, about uh, Hinduism and about Buddhism, uh, and thinking there's, there's a lot of, thinking that there were different kinds of wisdom that there was no room for in my life at that moment, but that I knew that I was going to need to come back to at some point, and I, and I feel like I'm now seeing those beginning to, to rear their heads. And so maybe what I'm getting at is that knowing oneself and, and being able to identify what those little inklings are that normally we would tend to ignore, but which actually have so much to tell us uh, 
being able to pick up on what those are and not being afraid to move towards those, even if we have no idea where they slot in, even if we haven't seen any models for what it looks like to bring those together with the other parts of our lives. That kind of self-knowledge, I think, is part of how I understand cryptology. I'm Jero, and I'm done speaking. Thanks very much, Jero. Um, thank you for sharing. And I would like to honor everyone's time and the fact that we're two minutes over. So um, we are going to move into wrapping up. I won't um, go into too much detail, but if there's anything um, you would like to explore from the, the Presencing Institute, you will find the, um, the link in the description of this club. Um, it's presencing.org. And we would like to remind everyone that we are holding the Global Forum on June 15th and 16th. And we invite you to check that out. You will find details on our on our homepage. And thank you so much, so much, Martin, for coming in today to share your, your stories and your inspiration with us. Um, many thanks to everyone who joined and who contributed to the conversation. And um, you will be able to find a recording of this call that we will post on our YouTube channel. And you will find the link in our social media posts within the next 24 hours. Again, thank you everyone for joining. Martin, is there any closing word you would like to say? Just to say thank you. Thank you for your contributions, the new insights I have gained, um, the flow, intelligence, one door at a time, and many other nuggets of wisdom that I have collected. Thank you very much. That's me. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, everyone who participated. Um, we wish you a lovely week, and we will be back with another Theory of You uh, Clubhouse session next week, which might be Tuesday or maybe on Wednesday, seeing as we've broken the pattern. And um, take care, everyone, and see you soon. Goodbye.